This episode of the Ready State podcast is brought to you by Element. I was just traveling this weekend at a coaches conference and hanging out with one of my favorite endurance coaches. And one of the things we're seeing is a definitely a trend of people going long once or twice. Yeah, especially because there's been this sort of renewed focus on doing a lot of zone two cardio, especially for to people. To balance out the high yeah, intensity exactly. exercise or as we get older, right? Yeah. We need zone two plus heavy. Yeah. So one of the things that we're seeing is people go long because they don't know how to fuel for that, right? Because you don't need to eat or drink anything to do a hit yeah, intensity yeah, exercise exactly. in, your, in your garage. But one of the things that we've learned from our superstar coaches is to try to not drink your calories. The goal is to try to eat a food and then treat your hydration separately. And sometimes clearly, as our friends like Rebecca have done, when you're running the Redville, Leadville 100, yeah, and of course there are you're exceptions gonna need, where people just need to drink eat, their calories. Eat, right? Right, but, yeah. but on the bike, particularly, or hiking, if you can eat a, a calorie, that's really what we're seeing Tour de France on our best athletes. And Element solves this so beautifully because it's very tasty. You can put Element in your bottle and know exactly how much salts you're getting, how much water you're getting, and simultaneously you can put your calories on the other side with a bar or a sandwich or a whole food. Yeah, and another big thing for me is that you know, almost all the snacks that you take on long rides and Ugh. long workouts are super sweet. All the goos and gels gnarly. and bars and things that you can fit in your pocket. And so the last thing I want to do is also be drinking a really sweet drink along with all that True. really sweet food. So the element is just such a nice balance and it's actually really tastes good when you're exercising. Yeah. And uh, not only will it make your water taste better, you'll drink more, but it's effective, effective hydration. So give this a shot and see how you feel. And especially if you're spending time in the sauna, you got to do this. So look, we literally drink it every day. And right now, if you order through our link, you can get a free sample pack with all of the Element flavors. Go to drinklmnt.com slash TRS. This episode of the Ready State Podcast is brought to you by Vitruvian. One of the things that Vitruvian gives you is easy programming, easy weight training in your house. Very safe. But... You can unlock some features that are easily built in. Like what? One of them I think is crucial is that if you have an orthopedic problem or a range you're staying away from, a range you're protecting, or a range you're weak in, or simply you're like, hey, at this place I start to compensate too much, you can set depths and positions so that the machine actually won't load those shapes. Right. So what you're saying is if, you know, when I squat down, if I get to a certain depth, my feet duck out and my ankles collapse. Yeah, you can and keep so going, I which can is less keep effective. going, but instead I can set it so that I only squat to a depth yeah. where I stay in a good, every good time, position. Every time you start with the exercise with a set, you will set the range that you want and the machine remembers that. And one of the features of Vitruvian, which is very, very cool, is that you can do really heavy eccentric loading, which means I could put, a, you know, 600 pounds on my back basically mm -hmm. and lower myself down and then it'll just cut off. And so I can have these really freakish eccentric exposures, but never end up in a position where I'm compromised or I'm going to get into trouble because I can set that. It's like pulling off of blocks or doing very sophisticated push training because you can just set the ranges. It's pretty bananas. It's so awesome. And you can do that in your garage, in your house. Yeah, or on your living room floor. I'm a fan. Uh, for more information, go to thereadystate.com slash Vitruvian. On this episode of the Ready State podcast, we are pleased to welcome Jared Hanley. Jared is a co-founder and CEO of NatureQuant, a research and technology firm building tools to assess and promote nature exposure. Prior to founding NatureQuant, Jared used data science and statistical modeling techniques and provided advisory services in finance, energy, and real estate applications. He is a published author and speaker on ERISA laws and plans. He has a BA in economics and a BA in cognitive science, both from Yale University. He's a FINRA registered securities principal and a chartered financial analyst. You know, I think what has stuck with me the most about our conversation with Jared is that the data shows that the average person is only spending, what was it, 120 minutes per week outside? Per week. And I think what's interesting, particularly is when adults hear that information, they're like, okay, yeah, yeah. But not me. That's not me. I'm different. And then you're like, well, hey, let's talk about your kids. And it shows out that they're probably spending just about the same amount of time outside. So, so we, what he's 
po pointing out through the sort of the, his app and this ecosystem is number one, man, we're not getting the outdoor exposure, sunlight, vitamin D, nature, fresh air. We're all living in these manufactured environments. And then simultaneously, sort of that the, some of the environments we spend our time in are poor environments, concrete jungles. Yeah. And, you know, they've done this really cool thing with their technology where they basically have mapped out the entire United States and can tell whether you're inside or outside. And they have this really cool app that we've all downloaded onto our phones now called Nature Dose, where you can actually really begin to sort of track and understand, you know, whether you're getting any real quality time outside. It's super interesting. Yeah. I, I love it brought up and I'm glad he brought it back up. The Japanese government has the Ministry of forest bathing, which is a technical term about, Hey, are you actually spending time in nature? And, you know, at risk of always saying where we're pining for our paleolithic selves when we were sleeping outside and, <laughs> you know, eating outside and, you know, there's gotta be a, a push and pull that we evolved for two and a half million years in outdoor environments. And suddenly we're not in those and there's clearly a cost on our health. So, I think this conversation is really interesting. Even just the fact that you're sort of aware of it puts it on your radar of easy things to solve. Hey, I just need to go outside and be around trees. Yeah. So um, there's a ton to learn and check it out. I think it was a really great conversation. What's up, Jared? Welcome to the Ready State Podcast. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. We are really excited. So before we get um, into some details uh, about all things nature, quant, and your life currently, am I correct that you had us... Uh, a phase of being an adventure racer and do we know people in common? Do that, I have that right? That's where you that's, need to start first. That's quite true. Yeah. I was completely obsessed with adventure racing for, at, for over a decade of my life and got to a pretty high level. You know, I raced for some sponsored teams and competed on the world stage. So, um, I definitely love so, being outside and that's, that's kind of a testament to that. Well, that's really nice about adventure racing. If you don't know this, everyone, it's basically you go five to seven days, sometimes only three days without sleeping. You go as far as you can, as many disciplines as you can. It's just suffering as much as you can. Yeah. And usually you have leeches on your body during Comma, some, some part of that. Or Definitely, you get dengue there's leeches involved. or you poop worms. Like it's really like, it's a, it's a gentlemanly sport for everyone. So were you adventure racing in the era of Rebecca Rush and Shane yep. Siegel? Our, yep. our I competed both against both of them. I can't say that I ever oh. beat them, Well, <laughs> but I was on the same starting <laughs> line. Yeah. Well, they're, uh, they're both yeah. mutants. So, um, so yeah. And then also I will say for our part, Kelly and I are adventure racing fans. I mean, Kelly actually did support for some adventure race in Northern California way back in the day. For Rebecca. I think that for Rebecca and Shane. And that was when I des race. decided that was not for me. Yeah. yeah you're like, Ro you're as, like sleeping as, too much. As we, yeah, as we, as we pull back just for a second, what was your favorite section of an adventure race? Cause I think I remember crewing for a race where they had to paddle like 20 miles in a ducky on a lake in the dark. And I was like, I'm not sure this is a sport I ever want to get into. Yeah, we actually, we had a race with a thing. Uh, it's on the Gallatin river kind of outside of Bozeman where there was a sport called river boarding that had a moment where you literally like lay on a little pool toy and go down rapids with just kick fins on. <laughs> and when you're at water level, uh, every wave seems enormous. And that happened to be like a almost flood stage day. And so that was unbelievably exciting. Um, scary, really. <laughs> so little known fact, it is a completely weird and fringe sport riverboarding. And coincidentally, our 15-year-old daughter, Caroline, is obsessed with riverboarding. And every time we go on river trips, we are all in yeah. other crafts. And no she way. is in a riverboard. Well, river I love board. it. I love that it's yes. still around. She has even riverboard in Grand Canyon. She owns a river. We own a riverboard. Isn't That's that That's amazing. I didn't even know they still sold them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 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 I mean, I think Lisa's going to have to put a link to what they are on, on the show notes. Cause it's really, I mean, talk about a fringe sport. It's like three people on earth yeah. actually do that. Okay. So we are talking to you today. We met through a, a mutual friend who put on our radar, this sort of epidemic of societal proportions where we're seeing what we think is a type one error in mm -hmm. humans that we aren't going outside. Can you tell us how you became sort of mini obsessed with this and sort of set the stage for us uh, about bringing this important idea to people so they can begin to change this fundamental yeah. behavior? Yeah. And hopefully part of that is like your evolution story of like adventure racer, you know, turned what you're sure. doing now. Yeah. Well, let me start with the societal commentary to just get on a soapbox and then I'll talk about 
me personally and then the company nature quant so yeah i i would completely reiterate the point that um we are all living in a very odd way especially when you think about humans from an evolutionary perspective you know life has evolved on earth for four billion years mammals a couple hundred million years and then all of a sudden this one strange species humans in just really the last 50 years has started living in these like built environments in these boxes that we're creating so it's just so new and so different it's just uh, a shock to the system our physiology and our psychology and we're now discovering that this new lifestyle inside in cities in front of screens 12 hours a day is really bad for us in many ways and so I don't think that people recognize that shift and that problem. And, you know, I'm trying to raise awareness around that and we're studying it pretty extensively and figuring out that this new lifestyle is just unhealthy and it needs to be balanced in, in many ways. And so that's kind of what's happening from a societal level. I saw that personally, you know, like many of us, I grew up as a kid outside playing, just enjoying the wilderness. And then I had a professional career that got me in the office, got me in front of screens and I kind of like, that lost my connection to the outdoor world. But I always found that going outside on these adventure races or bike rides or skiing or whatever was an amazing reset, like physically and more than that, mentally. It was just like a, a palate cleanse for the mind. And I, you know, I wasn't unique in that. And, and being a curious person, I, I kind of looked up like, why do I feel so much better working out outside than I do in the gym? And it turns out there's a whole body of scientific literature around that. Um, going way back to the 70s and 80s, really. And we now can state pretty confidently that being outdoors has unique impacts on our mental and physical health. And most people aren't capturing those benefits adequately because we're just inside too much during gyms. And let me just let me just pause this for a second, because what you described, I think everyone would subjectively agree with that statement, right? That, you know, I, I take this this animal wild cat. Like I think about cats who are just only indoors all the time. Like animals probably exist and need some sun. And if I extend that to myself, I probably need some sun light mm -hmm. in my body. But you're sort of hinting at that there's a body of science supporting that. And and will you elaborate yeah. a little bit on that? Because I think subjectively we're like, yeah, yeah, we all need to go outside. But that's yeah, so let's. Yeah, I mean, and just if I could add to that, I mean, we know there is a ton of research and data coming out, you know, both from a physiologic perspective perspective and a mental health perspective. And then I think if you combine those two things together, a longevity perspective we're that is, is, you know, we're not, we're not doing great. And I think the benefits of being outside are massive. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of data, but yeah. if you could, you know, if you could maybe tell us a little bit about some of the yeah, highlights out of the what people are working on. Feeling. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Feel let's better let's geek out on it. Cause that's you actually know. core to what we're doing. Um, so I think best, the best way to describe it is just do this like a um, thought experiment. So if we take two people, we send one person to a, like a park or a forest and have the other person go to a, an urban environment. So they're sitting in downtown Manhattan and we, we monitor various biomarkers. We'll see pretty distinct differences between those two individuals. And we see this consistently. So the person that went to a biodiverse natural environment is going to have a stronger immune system. So their natural killer cell count, which is like a white blood cell that attacks viruses and bacteria. After being exposed to a natural biodiverse environment, there's a response. That natural killer cell count goes way up. So your immune system is kind of triggered by that diversity and actually becomes stronger. So that's a big piece right there, just having a better immune system by being outside in this diverse environment. We'll also consistently see lower resting heart rate, lower blood pressure, lower cortisol level, and improved HRV or heart rate variability for the person in the, in the natural setting. And we think, and all those are metrics of of a more robust person. Well, a it's a less person? stressed person. Playing, playing devil, it's, you know, yeah. So I mean, there is this idea that when we're in a, a techno stress built environment, there's this like subconscious alarm going off all the time. We're hearing sirens. There's these lights. There's all of these weird, you know, like built elements. We're not seeing natural resources, and so there's this subconscious stress that being in a city or being just around the built environment consistently is triggering. But when you get into a natural environment, your body calms down. And we can see this pretty consistently and pretty rapidly, actually. So just going and sitting in the sunlight, staring at the trees for a moment, just allows us to calm down. And we see that in all these biomarker measurements. Also, your mood is going to improve. 
um, when you're outside. We see that consistently, especially when you're outside a city. Um, you're likely going to sleep better that night, especially if you get sunlight in your eyes that morning. So it resets your circadian rhythm by being outside. Most of us are vitamin D deficient. Obviously, getting sunlight is going to help there. And then cognitively, we, we see that people that spend time in that natural space versus a city have better memory, better attention span. Uh, they're more creative. So there's all these things that have been measured in these interventional studies and then bigger observational studies showing that we just are a better human when we're outside in these biodiverse environments with some regularity. So I, I wanted to tell you a quick story uh, that I was reminded of when you you mentioned going from being an adventure racer to like an office worker. Um, I was a river guide for many years in my 20s and then went to law school. And when I was applying for jobs, multiple people in interviews actually asked me if I was going to be able to work indoors, which I've always thought of since. Uh, and because of course my answer was, yes, I can work indoors. Do I want to always be working indoors? Not necessarily. Um, and then go figure Kelly and I opened a, an outdoor gym um, and, you know, we had a gym in a parking lot for many years. So, you know, we've, we, we've always biased towards trying to be outside. Um, but, but what I wanted to ask, uh, specifically on the biomarker side is, um, Kelly mentioned this after, after you guys had, had a prior conversation and there's some data coming in about kids in particular, which is something that I'm always particularly yeah, curious we, we about. We want to get there because I think adults listen to this and they think to themselves, they never apply this thinking yeah. to their children. And, and I think, um, if, if Kelly reported the data to me correctly, I think, you know, people will be shocked to hear what it is in terms of kids spending time outside. So I don't know if you could just tell us, you know, what are we learning about kids? How's the population different from adults? And, and is there independent data from a mental health or a physiologic standpoint that's showing the impact of this lack of spending time outside on kids? Yeah, um, I'm glad you brought that up. We do actually have a couple of clinical trials underway with teens. Um, we don't have any data on kids under 10, but for teens in particular, we're finding a few things. Um, one is kids that get outside with more regularity sleep better. And we know this because they have wearables on sometimes, you know, smart watches or even aura rings in some of our studies. And that's a big, big deal because a lot of kids just frankly are not getting enough sleep. And being outside seems to, again, reset their circadian rhythm and allow them to be tired at night and, and sleep better. And the other is mental health. Obviously, there's a, a mental health epidemic going on among our youth. There's not enough therapists or treatments out there. And it seems that getting people outside alone does improve mood. And so we actually have some, some therapists prescribing time outside and monitoring the impacts of that um, and comparing it to, obviously, other drugs. And time outside seems to be just as impactful. So simply to improve mood for kids, one great way to do that is to get them outside. And we don't know if it's exactly the nature or the fact that they're more active or maybe they're more social when they're outside, typically, than inside on their own looking at a screen. Whatever the mechanism of action is, we certainly see that when you get people outside, they're just simply happier. And that's true for teens as well as for adults. What is the data on how much time this teen group is actually spending outside? Yeah, well, give us some reference values. Are we talking about like I need to spend I, my kids are spending two hours outside and then you spend three hours outside? Yeah. So our technology is the first platform ever to be able to aggregate kind of time outside at scale. Historically, it's been survey data, which is kind of mixed in value. And I can tell you that people That's are not fine. spending a lot of time outside. Uh, the average for our entire population is about 130 minutes a week. So a little over two hours a week um, among teens. Oh, wait, wait, a week. You're saying in your entire population, the average person is spending 130 minutes outside a week. Correct. Very little time outside. That's part of wow. the societal problem that we're facing here. Um, and bear in mind, this includes um, winter. Right. And in the northern part of our country, it's cold and <laughs> people just aren't. And time in a vehicle does not count for us as time outside. But essentially, people are spending 96, 97 percent of their lives indoors or in vehicles. And I imagine. And what about kids? Is the data is the data similar for kids in terms of time spent outside or are they spending more or less? Uh, you know, I couldn't say definitively. Um, I will know more in about a year. I think it's probably quite similar. Um, so besides the adoption of whole scale 
convertibles across society, which is obviously what we're going to have to do. <laughs> Great solution, baby. Great solution. This. Can you tell us how you know this? Because tell us how you became interested in this mm -hmm. and how you came to begun to sort of quantify it and track it and, and what that technology looks like. Because I think yep. suddenly we're all very interested in saying, well, is that true for me? And how would I know? Yeah. So, I mean, first I saw the problem, I think as many others did. And I came across the research because I was experiencing it personally and want to understand just from a, you know, kind of a scientific standpoint, what is happening to me? Why do I feel so much better when I'm outside? And then I thought about what is the solution? Um, and you know, there's a couple things happening at that time. You know, Bitcoin was all the rage and people were focused on just tracking things numerically. You, you essentially create a unique number or create a number of any kind and society focuses on it. And one thing that time outside lacked was a number, right? People were not quantifying it. When you get a, you know, you're, you're tracking your steps, you're, maybe you're tracking your sleep, you're tracking your calories, your reps, whatever it is. No one was thinking about how much time they spend in different environments. So I wanted to build a technology to put a number on nature or nature exposure, A, and B, put that into a cell phone platform because most people are looking at their phones eight hours a day. So that's where you were going to get their attention. So ultimately, that all coalesced into Nature Dose, which is our mobile app, which tracks your time outside. You know, what I think is so cool about this is, is that, you know, pretty much everybody has a phone or some kind of device. And they pretty much have it with them all the time. You know, Kelly and I like to point this out because we're obsessed with getting people to walk and move more, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it, it's very connected to being outside because usually you're doing it outside. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the reasons we're fans of walking. But, you know, we remind people that as long as you have your phone, you have a tracker. It's, it's, it may not be exactly perfect in terms of tracking your steps, but you can certainly get a general rough idea of how much you're moving in the day. Yep. And I just think it's so cool that without doing anything other than just having downloaded this on your phone, you can get some really good individual data on how much time you're spending outside. And man, if, if that data about the average person spending, you know, 130 minutes outside a week is correct, I think people will probably be pretty shocked to learn. And, you know, and I do think, I mean, are you finding that people using this are changing their behavior? Because obviously that is the ultimate goal, right? Is the knowledge that, you know, when people learn that they're just plain not spending enough time outside, mm -hmm. are they changing their behavior? And and what tools do you have to support that? Yep. Well, two thoughts there. Um, is The first thing is we intentionally built this app to be passive. We didn't want to be part of the attention economy where you're starting and stopping and logging all your activity. There are plenty of activity trackers out there that can log your runs, right, or your bike rides. We wanted this to be something that kind of works in the background feeds that important data to you, but doesn't suck you into your phone all the time. And so because of that, it's kind of a balance in terms of a really powerful interventional tool. So I think for people who are aware of this, how important this is and motivated to improve their health, they use it a lot, but it's not gamified in the way that you're getting a badge and a reward and you know, you're getting likes on social media for your nature dose time. And I do think once we build some of those other features in, maybe it'll be a more powerful intervention for good and bad, right? But right now it's it's kind of a, a data tool for those who who recognize the importance of, you know, changing their environment, getting outside with some occasion, getting off screens with some kind of regular interval. So I know there's a lot of data, um, additional data, if we could still keep nerding out on the data on the more, um, you know, because I know we talked a bit about the sort of mental health side and mood, mm -hmm. um, but also, and I think you alluded to this a little bit, but I know that there's, and I've read, there's some pretty interesting data about um, disease, you know, separate apart from immune system, yep. which you discussed. Um, can you talk to a little, talk to us a little bit about what, what we're seeing in the data there from, yep. you know, just a connection between being out so being outside and avoiding disease or generally being healthy. Yeah. So now we're looking at longitudinal studies. And so we have a whole nother side of our business. It's called nature score, which is actually looking at the quality of environments as they pertain to built and natural elements. So we've mapped every piece of nature in the U S down to every 10 meters, every tree, every park, body of water. We have every building footprint, every highway. And so if we know, you know, what the environment looks like, and we know where people live and where they work, we can look back over the last 50 to 70 years and see what kind of environment were people in and who got cancer. 
who got heart disease, right? And who basically lived longer. And we've done that uh, kind of at scale with several large cohorts of people. Um, I think in aggregate, it's about 70,000 people in the U.S. going back 50 years. And we can say with confidence that being in a, in a nature-rich environment reduces cancer, reduces heart disease, um, reduces obesity, reduces asthma, reduces mental distress, and you just frankly live longer. The catch-all is there's a reduction in all-cause mortality if you're in an environment that has adequate nature. And and again, I know you mentioned this earlier. Do you think the mechanism is just plain being outside, or is it because we tend to be moving and playing and yeah. doing? You know, we tend to be doing physical activity more often when we're outside. And and then you know, like like everything, you know, once you start doing things, and then you you know, it it sort of spins on itself. Are you, and are you're you defending your tree huggerness? Oh, deep down, deep down. So yeah. there's a lot of theories out there. I can't say with any confidence what is exactly happening, but I can give you some of the theories. Um, so the first is this old friends theory. Uh, so when you're in this biodiverse environment, you're actually like breathing in, they're called phytoncides or organic compounds that all these plants and animals are emitting mushroom spores, et cetera. And you're not even aware of that but you're exposing your, your chemical being to this diverse environment, which we evolved in. And so when you take your body away from that, right, and you're in this like sterile indoor environment, all of a sudden there's some kind of imbalance in our microbiome or our chemical system. So that's the old friends theory. And as I mentioned before, your immune system actually gets weaker when you're not in a biodiverse environment. So having a weak immune system may lead to increased or re reduction in longevity. So that's one theory. Another theory is that it's nature is good for us. Yes. But actually what's happening is cities are really bad for us. <laughs> so you're the air pollution's worse. You're stressed out all the time. You're maybe not sleeping as well. So people that are in these dense urban environments just happen to live in less healthy environments. It's not so much that nature is the benefit. It's that cities causing harm. And the third is, uh, and we try and account for this. These are called covariates is, Usually in these nature rich neighborhoods versus nature poor neighborhoods, there's all these other social and environmental factors that can have an impact on our health. And as much as we try and like parse those apart, it just happens that these environments that are city environments maybe have poor food quality, people are less active. Um, you know, there are other just elements at play that we just can't even understand. You know, humans are complex, the environment's complex. So I can't say A is causing B. All I can say is the association is profound and it's consistent. Being in a nature diverse environment is really associated, very tightly associated with just being healthier and living longer. This episode of the Ready State Podcast is brought to you by Momentus. One of the things that is a staple in my diet from, from Momentus is collagen. True fact. And I think there are better and worse ways to use collagen. Like, I think we're just talking about gut health. We're just talking about like, hey, this is probably something human beings have been eating for a long time. Greg Cook pointed out a long time ago. He's like, what do you think humans' first food was after, after breast milk? Bones. <laughs> but like soaked in a <laughs> stew, right? right? So it was probably some kind of bone broth right away. Right. So one of the things that I think people can grok is, hey, these things are part of human diets and have been for a long time. We can see the application of using collagen, particularly when people have a hot tendinopathy or we're loading something. And we know we're going to see a lot of upregulation of collagen synthesis, like in an Achilles. And so I think if you're battling a tendinopathy problem, you've got a hot spot, take your collagen 30 minutes earlier, then 30 load minutes that like thing. before exercise. Before Is that exercise. what you mean? 30 minutes earlier? Yeah. So if you're doing a bunch of exercises because you've got a hot elbow or hot Achilles, take that collagen 30 minutes before you plan loading it. Then when your body is calling for it, it's going to be there. And I think that's the way we should be thinking about like targeted collagen supplementation. Is that why how uh, why every time I go out to the garage, I find little collagen hey, shots? You promised empty not to bring around, this up. Like the skier like and the bikes. And I feel is that is that because you're employing this strategy I yourself? Am. I am. There is like you're not wrong. There's like a, a detritus, like a strand line of collagen. Yeah, I can see what workout you've done yeah. based on where your collagen shot oh, is. Thanks, but and I want everyone to know that Juliet literally and figuratively hides them in my stuff as payback. You're like, Hey, hon, do you want a Including coffee? Including on your pillow. It's right. It's in there. <laughs> Look, if you want to learn more about uh, momentous collagen, go to live slash TRS and use code TRS for 20% off your first purchase. 
This episode of the Ready State Podcast is brought to you by Yeti. And what we want to talk to you about today is our love affair with the yonder stop, bottle. Stop, stop. You talk about your yonder more than you talk about your daughter at college. What? What are you even talking about? That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's leak proof. You could Look, you can put hot things in here. You can put cold things in here. And more importantly, should you even use protein, you rinse it right out. Well, and here's the thing. I am a huge fan of all Yeti stuff, including all of their insulated cups and bottles. But man, I find myself in a lot of situations <laughs> where weight matters. Traveling, camping. Dude, the story of my stuff. life. I carry on these these thunder thighs. My, well, my yeah, bottles you don't need be to thigh. carry those thighs and a heavy so insulated true. bottle You'll when you like get on the plane. We were traveling this weekend for some work, and I brought. I was like, I'm going East Coast. I'll have some hot drinks. So I brought an insulated bottle, and I snuck into the airport with a full bottle of water. Because you like, forgot, because forgot. you couldn't see how yes. much water you had. And I had to literally chug the water. There was no place to dump it. Out. I was just chugging. It's yeah. going to my face, and people were behind me like, "Sir, can you hurry up that chug?" If I had a yonder, no problem. Yeah, and Georgia recently just lost one of her insulated bottles at an airport because she didn't realize she had water in it, mm. which wouldn't have happened if she'd had a yonder. The yonder. And I also, the other thing that I really have had happen to me is I've had bottles leak, and the yonder yeah. does not leak. Yeah, I mean, you can rest assured you can put this thing in your backpack or your bag with your laptop and all your other tech, and you know that your stuff is going to be Have safe. you ever had that time where like you have a backpack full of Fabergé eggs, and you're like, what bottle am I going to put over here because I'm afraid it's going to leak? Not the yonder. You don't have to worry about that. That's never been a thought I've had, but thank you. <laughs> it could happen. Look, <laughs> if you want to learn more or get your own yonder, go to the readystate.com slash Yeti. So I, I guess, um, you know, what I imagine some listeners would be wondering is, you know, how do we what do we do? Because a lot of people listening to this live in dense urban environments. Mm -hmm. It actually seems like as a species, we're actually going to continue to move more towards more people living in denser urban environments versus people living out in, you know, more, more like rural or you know, even suburban environments. Yeah. And, and the, the, we recently actually just had Dan Butner on our podcast, who is the Blue Zones guy, mm -hmm. and he's doing uh, this really interesting work on a population level with communities in particular uh, through the Blue Zones projects to try to make these small changes to the environment that are making these very measured and big changes to people's overall health. And one of those things that he mentioned is just simply, you know, anytime there's a road work done in a Blue Zone community, they have to add sidewalks and trees, yep. some basic basic things like that. So, so, you know, what is, what is the solution here? Assuming as a human species, most of us yep. are probably going to continue living in urban environments and are, raise our kids in urban environments. And, you know, I think b based on where you are in Oregon and where Kelly and I are North of San Francisco, I think we have unlimited access to nature and outdoors, mm -hmm. probably outside our back doors, but that's not a reality for most people. So, so, you know, how do we solve this, you know, given, our modern way of yeah. living in urban environments. It's a super hard problem, um, but I do have some ideas um, and they're kind of twofold. So the first is uh, basically creating healthier environments. And one thing, as I mentioned in this, these nature score maps, we actually now know where the nature deficient communities are. And we've built uh, essentially by neighborhood level scores for nature richness. And so we can quickly screen for these areas where people are living and they don't have adequate access to nature. So if the tree canopy is low, there's no parks nearby. And then we can direct funding into those neighborhoods to plant more trees, build more parks. And actually just two weeks ago, the, there was a billion and a half dollars of funding through the Inflation Reduction Act for urban greening. And they're gonna use data like ours and others to identify those nature deficient communities and make sure that those people living in those areas have access to nature. So that, it's not an easy task and it's very expensive, but that's phase one is building healthier cities. And then I think phase two, and oh, it, go ahead. Really quickly, just on that phase one, before you tell me about phase two, is that effective? You know, for people listening to this that live in a city, you know, Kelly and I lived in San Francisco for a long time, but we were lucky enough for most of that time to live within a block of Golden Gate Park. And so we had access to, mm -hmm. you know, it was a huge urban park, but we still had access to parks and beaches. You know, is that enough if people have, even if they're in an urban area, but have access to things like parks, is that enough? Is that, well, that, is that equivalent? That's my phase two. So actually what we're finding is there's plenty of people that live near nature, but they don't go outside, right? They, so you may have a beautiful park down the street, but you're never going there. You know, obviously, as we discussed, people are spending more than 95% of their lives indoor. 
So the phase two is really raising awareness around the importance of exposing yourself to these other environments, getting outside, getting sunlight in your eyes, getting around a biodiverse environment, getting off screens. And that's where we feel our mobile app can come in and make a difference by gamifying and quantifying time outside. So, you know, you have to measure what matters, right? So you can motivate people to get outside. I, I mean, our vision is to have the fourth ring of the Apple Watch be nature dose, right? Have every health and wellness platform include time outside as one of all those data points that people are thinking about because we feel it's that impactful. If, he, if people are spending, I mean, my math isn't good, but it's like 25 minutes a day, <laughs> I think seven times 25, I mean, it kind of gets me there. Um, it's not a lot of time. Is there a sort of a, a minimum effective dose? You know, because this is, and I, I want to be careful, I don't end up saying, well, like, how many minutes do I have to go outside to be like <laughs> ma minimally healthy? Like that's yeah. not the goal. The goal is to like, you know, uh, Juliet, I've been doing this thing for as long as I've known Juliet called the one man attack on the sun, where I literally just expose as much of my skin to the sun as I can. Yep. And then the sun gets tired and goes down and I remain. That's really the short of it, everyone. <laughs> but how do, how should I think about, should I just always be thinking, Hey, if I have an opportunity to go outside, I like, there's no, yeah. You know, we, we go in the summer and we will spend a week, you know, sleeping under the stars and being outside and, you know, even just watching our kids, our kids do a sport that they, it happens in outdoor pools here in California. Mm -hmm. We're so lucky. I mean, I just think about all the parents who are forced to be outside and watch their kids play soccer and softball, yeah. right? You yeah. could be saving their lives with that sport. Yeah. But is there a minimum so effective where we see that those changes happen? We're studying that now pretty extensively with our mobile app and our clinical trials. And we're actually about to launch a huge study in, uh, via funding from the European Commission throughout a bunch of regions in Europe to study this further. But I can tell you the scientific consensus right now is 120 minutes per week in nature. So that's not just outside. So environmental quality mm -hmm. matters. Again, as I said, if you're sitting in like a busy urban environment, you may not be getting a lot of the benefits because you're still stressed out, even subconsciously. So if you can get 120 minutes in a, in a nature diverse environment, like a park or a river, that's kind of the minimum dose that you should shoot for. There was a big survey done in the UK about time outside and health. And that landed right at about 120 minutes a week. So two hours a week, I think is a good starting point. The second point I'll make is you want to have at least 20 minute sessions. So just walking from your house to your car or whatever in a five minute session doesn't seem to have the same impact as a designated 20 minute block of time outside. When we follow stuff like cortisol level, which is a stress hormone or amygdala activity, which is kind of mental stress. We see both of those things improve after that, you know, 15 to 20 minute session. So I would say two hours a week is a good starting point and 20 minute blocks. And, you know, we, again, I'm, I'm back to the walking tip, which we are always talking about because we're obsessed with walking. But one of the things we've noticed is that, you know, people who live in urban areas are often surprised to learn how little people move in suburban and yeah. more rural areas. You know, often the New Yorkers are like, I easily walk 10,000 steps a day without even thinking about it because it's part of their lifestyle. But are you saying, you know, if you're spending, you know, if you're getting 10,000 steps, which means you're spending a fair bit of time outside, but all that time is done sort of in between high rise buildings, you know, with maybe surrounded by a lot of yeah. automobile pollution and, you know, maybe not access to the sun directly because there's high buildings. You know, are you saying that time wouldn't be as valuable as this, the person going and sitting in Central Park for 25 minutes? So like I can say the historical interventional studies show that that's less impactful walking in a city. And then in our clinical trials, we're seeing the same. So walking in a park is superior to walking in a city. Both are exercise, right? But you're just not getting right. the same kind of like um, ancillary benefits of the environmental impact. Well, sometimes it's good. Moving is better than not moving. But mm -hmm. my, one of our coaches, Travis, and I have been texting back and forth all these ridiculous 20 minute electrical, mechanical, like you put a suit on and you can get all the benefits of, of exercise in eight minutes and it like, it just like shocks your, your muscles <laughs> and you do BFR and it's cold. And I'm, you were sort of like, I think you may be missing the point. Yeah. Like, you know, the goal isn't to just to truncate this down to a vitamin, you know, yeah. and the goal is not just to move more that, you know, the goal is to see, see if we can max yeah. out the qu the quality of the things we're doing. It's, 
we just had a friend who we were talking to at a game. Her son is swimming at college and he started swimming indoors and it really changed mm -hmm. his worldview a little bit. He was still doing all the movement. He's still active, but all of a sudden he really felt differently and, and he you know, was moving to a different environment. But I just, I think that we don't think of it necessarily that way. Yeah. What made me think of was when Caroline was born, she spent three weeks in the NICU and when they discharged us, they were like, you got to give your kid. You know, this story is triggering for some people. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, you've got to give your kid these vitamins. And I was like, no, I don't. And they were like, no, no, you have to give your kid this vitamins. And I was like, look at me in the eye and tell me that mother's milk isn't perfect food. And they were like, uh, and I was like, tell me. And they're like, we can't. I was like, well, what's the problem? And they said, well, mothers in the city aren't going outside and they're not creating vitamin D. Mm -hmm. And I, vitamin D is atrogenic. It comes out through the breast milk. And it turns out kids weren't getting any vitamin D because they they had no sun exposure and their parents had no sun exposure. So the solution was to hand these fake vitamins yeah. out to give to newborns. And I was like, this is crazy. It's crazy. It's yeah. crazy. That's it's it's funny you mentioned that. I mean, I actually use the analogy often that when you're inside, you're basically eating a processed environment. It's all processed food. That's kind of the equivalent. But when you go outside, you're eating a salad, right? It's it's all natural. And it's crazy to think about 95% of our environment that we consume is processed because you wouldn't want to eat 95% processed food. But that's kind of what we're doing. And while you don't think about your environment as you know, having the same impact as food, and maybe it doesn't, it, to some extent, it does have real impacts on your mental health and physical health. And so you just don't want to be in a processed environment all the time. You know, it seems like what we're talking about here is sort of this environment human mismatch. And I'm sure you know, Kelly and I tried to tackle this problem in our own way, you know, starting 10 or 15 years ago, um, because what we saw in our physical therapy clinic was the environment human mismatch of people sitting all the time. Mm -hmm. And then in many cases, you know, sitting for 12 hours and then like trying to run a marathon and wondering why their Achilles tore or yeah. whatever. Um, but, but it seems to me that, you know, that that's really kind of what we're seeing, you know, on a societal level is this environment, environment, human mismatch. Like, you know, we haven't, in, we, we are doing all these things, but we haven't actually evolved to, to thrive in, in these new environments because it really is so new. Oh, exceptionally new, especially from an evolutionary perspective. I mean, um, really since the industrial revolution or people just living in cities, let alone now in cities inside all the time. And so it's just this huge social experiment and we don't really know what the outcome is going to be. But the more we study, the more we realize that, you know, these new environments we're building for ourselves and our new behaviors indoors, sitting in front of screens are just really detrimental. And so, you know, we're a technology company, obviously, so we're not anti-tech, we're not anti any of that, but we just need to find a better balance. And I don't think society is recognizing the need for that balance. When you sort of, you, you have this, this app, you're starting to sort of get traction in the background, thinking about industrial design and where governments are putting their money. That's, that's, a, those are big sticks. Did you think that that's one, the first question is, is this a difficult sell for people? Or is it difficult for you to make the case in these urban environments or at these population levels or at these, I mean, are, do people understand sort of what you, you all are quantifying? I think that's really the magic is what you're quantifying. Do, is, is it a difficult sell yes. or is it an easy, easy swim? It's, it's a difficult sell because this is a long-term kind of preventative behavior or preventative measure for a society. I mean, you plant a trees, it's going to take 30 years before that thing's mature, right? And providing shade and, and all the, the lovely things that it does. Um, you know, going outside for one day is not going to eliminate your cancer risk and cause you to lose weight. Um, so this is like a long-term kind of wellness and preventative medicine strategy where people are dealing with fires, right? They're dealing with emergencies all the time. And so talking about the future, building better cities for our great grandkids or you know, getting someone to go for a walk when they have 10 emails they have to respond to is tough. It's a tough sale for sure. So I know we talked a little bit about this with the sort of city versus rural environment, but if just to sort of drive the point home, what actually counts as nature? <laughs> so I can tell you how we define it because that's a great question. So <laughs> You know, we aggregated, as I said, uh, it's 35 different remote sensing data sets and technology. So think about like high res um, satellite imagery with a computer vision layer that tells us, okay, here's a bush, here's a tree, 
here's a lawn, here's a building footprint, a highway. Um, and then we have all of this historical health record data, uh, who lived where and who got what diseases. And we ran a machine learning process between those two things to tell us which elements of nature are most impactful on health. So the goal for our machine learning process was longevity. What kind of a natural environment bestowed the longest, healthiest lives for the populations that we're training it against? And so our definition of nature in our models for both our maps and our mobile app is nature that bestows health benefits. And so we see a pretty distinct difference. Standing in the middle of a desert versus a forest are two different environments. They're both nature, right? I don't think anyone would argue with that, but you don't see the same health impacts when you're not in a biodiverse environment. Also, we're finding that like live biomass, so greenness seems to be more impactful than like a scree field of rocks. Uh, water seems to have great impact on mental health, but it doesn't have the same reduction in cancer rates. So there's all these like nuances, right? Being around Douglas fir trees might help improve air quality and reduce asthma, uh, but you know, it's shady and dark. And so maybe you're less inclined to, to go for a walk. So it's, it's a complicated definition for us, but it's really what nature in our models correlates most tightly with improved health. What is so you, you, you have been at this for a second. You're starting to gather some of this, this essential baseline, like the 120 minutes a week is, as a baseline, as a freaky baseline. What are has most surprised you about this work? Because uh, let me just say that your bias, mm -hmm. right, your intrinsic hidden bias from yourselves is that, you know, it's probably, I feel better when I'm outside and that's probably good for us. Yeah, you I mean, know? it makes intuitive, like we <laughs> all, it, it does it, it make does. intuitive sense. But what has surprised you yeah. about your scientific process in terms of really getting to the bottom of this a little bit or, or exploring what is nature or exploring, yeah. you know, what the benefits are when we actually are not living in manufactured homes. Well, I was shocked at how little time we're, we're seeing people outside. Um, I think, you know, I, I love the outdoors. So I tend to associate with people who also like being outside and appreciate it. But when you look at a population level, um, just, to, I was surprised at how little time people are spending outside a, but from uh, the research perspective, the two things that were just jumped off the chart is we had one study with a cohort of college students and the more they sp time to spend outside, the happier they were. Like it was just the A to B, which was really exciting to see and kind of confirmed a lot of our theories. And the second is pairing outside time with sleep quality data, because those things we see instantaneously and, you know, the association is very, very strong. And so it's, it's great to see those numbers kind of jump off the off the off the page, if you will, the longer term stuff about you know reducing diseases, you know cancer rates, heart disease, I'm excited about, but we really don't have any you know confirmation yet, and we really won't for quite a while. Uh, but the things that jump off the page are again, you know, shocking how little time people are spending outside, and and exciting to see um, how a little change in behavior, just spending a few more minutes outside per week, can have a great impact on on mental health and sleep. All I can think I was, of is this is a terrible business. The worst business I can think of is trying to get people to stretch. The second <laughs> business is how are you going to sell nature to people? Yeah. How do we package this to yeah. actually, what's, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, like I'm having, hey, you haven't purchased your nature today. Yeah, exactly. Well, what You're a terrible like, business yeah. model. What are you even thinking? How are you going to get rich? Well, probably not, frankly, <laughs> but maybe. <laughs> I, I will say this. The reception we get is, is amazingly positive everyone is really, really excited about what we're doing. We're creating novel data that just didn't exist historically, and it's turning out to be really important data. So there's a lot of organizations that want to get behind this, uh, both, you know, outdoor brands. Um, there's a bunch of nonprofits, you know, that, that use our work, municipalities, uh, the federal government is looking at this data. So, you know, I think as time outside becomes an integral part of healthcare, and we are showing that just by going outside, healthcare costs are reduced. Actually, we have one yeah, study is, huh? showing that when you're outside, you cost your insurance company $400 less per year. So once your insurance company recognizes that, oh, wait, I can just tell people to go outside and I don't have as much expense for that individual. This is a, this is a great ROI for me. That'll happen. And then I also think in, in foreign countries where there's a single payer healthcare system where they actually are trying to reduce healthcare costs, right? Because they're trying to save money for the state they'll realize, oh, we need this kind of behavioral intervention because it's just the best investment for reducing healthcare expense. 
So I think ultimately so one, there are these big pools that we will play a big role in. It's just a long yeah. educational curve. It's the long game. I was particularly excited to see the study about college age kids because we just dropped our kid off at college and we were actually really pleased to see when we dropped her off that her dorm is at least a 15 minute walk to any of her classes outside, <laughs> even in the cold and she Michigan lives across winter. the street from a cemetery. Yeah. yeah. And so, and, the Arboretum. And, and yeah, and the Arboretum. And so she, um, you know, in order to actually do the thing she's there to do, which is go to class, she has to spend quite a bit of time outside and will have to do that even when it is, you know, as cold as we Californians have ever known it to be. Yep. And so I was, um, I, I saw that, I saw that study on your, on your website and I thought that was cool yeah. just on a personal. Well, level. it's like a, a natural, uh, sauna session or cold plunge, right? They got to walk in the hot and cold. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I think, uh, I keep, I'm always served that like why Scandinavian families leave their babies outside in the winter. And you know, what you're actually describing sounds very Scandinavian where, mm -hmm. you know, you go see your, you know, I feel sad or I've depressed and you know, someone prescribes me walks, yeah. you know, like this is really and progressive thinking. I, that does lead me to a question though. Uh, you know, I, I know that you've done all this serious mapping in the United States. Have you guys gone mm -hmm. outside? Is this going to be a worldwide, um, worldwide data collection and study? And if you are already doing that, what's the difference between, yeah. you know, what we're seeing here and in other countries? So as an, we just got a huge grant from the European commission to map all of Europe and we'll be doing a kind of a large scale study with our mobile app in Europe uh, that won't launch till 2025. Um, but it's interesting. A lot of other countries are way more um, down this path than we are in the United States where nature is just commonly seen as like an important component to lifestyle and health. So obviously uh, Japan has this concept of forest bathing, which you may have heard. Uh, they've been doing forest bathing since the 80s. They actually have a federal office of Shinrin Yoku. So there's a part of the government sole mission is to get people outside. So there's other you know populations around the world that are already using this technology. And so we're trying to get our, our maps and our mobile app active in those regions. Um, we don't have an exact timeline, but I'm hoping by the end of 25, we'll basically have global coverage. I'll be really curious to see that European data because we've had occasion to spend quite a bit of time in Europe because Kelly grew up there and do a lot of outdoor activities. Yeah. And what we've noticed is how much uh, they value spending time outside and um, how much they have made the outdoors accessible and fun to That's everybody. Really, really I mean, just the simple fact um, you know, our kids love hiking in Germany, for example, they don't love hiking. Generally, they love hiking in German in the German Alps, because you can be 15 miles in on a trail and there's a restaurant yep. where they serve you a meal on an actual dish. And it's, it's sort of part of the culture that it should be fun and accessible and there should be food involved and it's social. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you just contrast that with here. It's, it's like you, in, in many ways, and in many of our outdoor environments, you need to be kind of hardcore to want to go do that. It needs to be, you know, people who, who well, I was just even thinking about the yeah. beer gardens, just the right. beer gardens there. People are sitting in forest areas, yeah. interacting right. and just eating a chicken and having a beer and there's no phones on the table. It's really yeah. bananas. Yeah. Well, in Sweden, if you can demonstrate that you commute outside, either on a bike or walking, they give you tax breaks, right? So they are really motivated to get people outside. And in the States, we're just not there. I mean, our healthcare system is totally different, right? It's, it's, it's for profit, right? And you, no one makes money when someone goes outside. And so we just don't have the same incentive systems built here yet, mm. but we can get there. Um, I think education yeah. first, and then we can build the kind of incentives. Yeah, behind it makes it. me even think about your walking school bus. Just the, the simple ex saying we have 20 minutes to walk this mile to school. I mean that, you know, there and back is 40 minutes of just walking in a neighborhood, even just the step one, you know, if I can't force me to be in nature, step two, I can get outside. I think that's an important yeah. piece for people that, you know, Hey, thinking about what's the most dense mm -hmm. nature environment I can find myself in. That's always, I can max that out. But if I can't, I can just at least get outside and have some sunlight yeah. on my face. We're seeing that our friends like Andrew Huberman and, you know, Jack Cruz, people are really talking about, you know, early light, late light yep. as yeah, it's like one of the critical drivers, critical drivers. Yeah. 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 And you know, I, I would also make the point that in a lot of these European and other countries, the weather 
isn't necessarily stopping people from spending out time outside. I mean, I think it's, it's mm-hmm. sort of this decidedly American thing where it's like, well, it's winter. We're going to go inside for nine months. Yeah. Um, but you don't see that in other cultures. They're still doing things outside. Yeah. Well, I have one other idea about how we can affect a, a massive change rapidly. And that is kind of appeal to the conscience of the big tech companies. I mean, the reality is, you know, those technology companies are part of why we're spending so much time inside in mm. front of screens. They're addicting us all. I mean, frankly, we are all slaves to their algorithms right now. And, um, you know, if they become aware of some of the health damages that at a societal level that they're causing, they may want to put a little money into motivating people to get outside of it, right? Just counterbalance some of the, the harms that big tech is causing uh, in terms of public health. Um, not only like mental stress that we're seeing from a lot of these addictive social apps, but also just raw screen time, right? They make money the longer you're stuck to that screen. And they're very good at getting you stuck to that screen. And they also have I do love- billions of dollars. <laughs> so with a little bit of charity, maybe they can, they can help out. I really do love the idea of spending that time outside being a circle on the Apple Watch. I mean, I have so many friends who are obsessed with closing the circle. And if there was just one more circle that was spending time outside, I mean, that those circles are a motivator. Yeah. So I hope that happens. Yeah. Thanks. Me too. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> well, uh, having been a child who gr- had the f- great fortune of being uh, a latchkey kid in a Bavarian forest, you know, <laughs> I just, uh, what you're saying just really, really, really resonates with me and, and just how fortunate I was to grow up where I just, I was forced to ride my bike. I didn't have a lot of choice, you know, the, and the key here and the takeaway for me was the default was to accidentally do the right thing. I didn't mm-hmm. have a choice. I had to walk to school. I had to ride my bike. I had to walk through these, drive through these, ride through these forests. And I think that's more and more as Juliet and I keep coming around to how do we constrain the environment so it's not one more thing I have to do? How, yeah. how do we shape our, our institutions and our schools and our work environments so that we automatically end up doing the right thing? It's, it's, I think that's the, the lens we, we could best look through this. Well, and I, and I would just like to say um, it's really cool what you're doing. Um, I love all the data. When Kelly first met you and told me about the work you were doing, of course, we related to it immediately and our fans. Um, for people listening to this who want to download the app and learn more about the data and research and all the things you're doing, can you tell them where to find where to find it and you? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you. Um, so the mobile app is called Nature Dose. It's, it's in both app stores, the uh, Google Play and the, the Apple App Store. Uh, it's free. Um, so check it out and then give us feedback we're, you know, we're constantly evolving the app. We're trying to you know, build in better features and better feedback, uh, to people using the app. Um, and then if you want to learn more about our, our general research and kind of other mapping tools, go to naturequant.com quant short for quantification, naturequant.com. And we have a blog there with a bunch of research articles and commentary on uh, kind of the latest in the, on the science. And then you can reach me, Jared Hanley on LinkedIn. Um, if you have a novel use for our data or you want to do some research or anything exciting like that, I always love talking to people about ways we can apply kind of this novel information to different aspects of our lives. Great. And are you nature quant or nature dose on the social medias if people want to follow and learn more there? Um, uh, both, but really nature dose, you know, that's the public facing, um, mobile app. Uh, we do sell a lot of data to, to governments and healthcare institutions to research this, but that's mostly business to business. So nature dose is where you, you should look. Great. Do it and get your kids on it. <laughs> Don't even need to know. Just to put it on their phones. Yeah. One hour and 20 minutes, people. One hour and 20 minutes. Hey, thank you so much for taking this on. I feel like it's the task of Sisyphus <laughs> to remind people to be people. You know, one man attack on the sun, more validation for me. I love it. And uh, we really appreciate you. And uh, I can't wait to see how our community sort of, you know, gets behind this because I think it's, it's, we understand these systems are complex and tightly connected. And it seems like if just the single act of going outside forces me to talk to my neighbors and get sunlight and be yeah, in nature. Yeah, it makes my kids' mental health slightly better. That, that's a win. Sign me yeah, up. Yeah, for sure. Well, thanks again for having me. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for listening to the Ready State Podcast. If you like what you're hearing, check out all our episodes here or at the readystate.com. 
And be sure to subscribe and leave a review on iTunes to help others find our show. Check us out and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Ready State. Until next time, cheers, everyone. You got it. You better stop it.